Hello and welcome to episode four of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams working in high risk, high consequence environments. Our mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. In this episode, we'll talk about the importance of completing a 360-degree size-up. We'll share a near-miss event where a combination of inexperience, freelancing, and assumptions led to a loss of accountability. And we'll address a community member's question about how to develop expert knowledge in young officers who are seeing less fires. Situational Awareness It starts with capturing information, clues and cues in your environment. It's really a quite simple premise to capture clues and cues. Simply requires seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and or smelling information. At a structure fire, it's hopefully you're using mostly seeing and hearing and not tasting and smelling so much. The visual clues and cues occupy a finite environment, the building and the space around the building. I am nothing short of astounded at the number of firefighters telling me that they do not complete a 360 degree size up of a structure fire before making entry. I was inspired to do this podcast topic after two recent accounts that were shared with me. Into the basement we went. The first account came to me by the way of a firefighter sharing a near-miss event with me following a mental management of emergencies program. She was part of a crew of two that did not complete a 360-degree size-up as at a residential dwelling fire. The crew made entry through the front door and almost immediately fell through the floor and were trapped in the basement. As she recounted the details, I was reminded of the similar residential fire that killed two firefighters in Colerain Township, Ohio. The firefighter I spoke to and her partner fared much better as they were rescued and survived. Getting yelled at for completing a 360 degree size up. The second account came to me by way of an email that I received from a firefighter who offered up a topic for me for an upcoming situational awareness conference call training program that I was going to be conducting. Here's what he shared. At my department, the 360 degree size up is almost frowned upon. When we catch a job, I always have the driver pull past the house to see three sides, and then I try to do a walk around. It never fails that I get yelled at to get into the fire. Now, I love going into burning buildings, but having lost a firefighter because he fell through a floor because nobody did a walk around and saw the basement was on fire, I feel a good walk around saves lives. I find myself peer pressured into just going into the fire and not doing a 360 for fear I'm going to get yelled at. 360 degree size ups should be a standard practice. I'm disappointed with how many fire departments have no written standard requiring a 360 degree size up. I'm even more discouraged when I learn that departments have a standard, but it's not practiced. I'm appalled when firefighters share with me that the practice is discouraged. There are a few things a first responder can do to help build the foundation of situational awareness, like conducting a proper 360 degree size up. The 360 size up at any residential dwelling fire allows you to capture and process some of the most important clues and cues of what's happening at the incident. Not only can you see the conditions from all angles, 
but you can also observe important clues about construction, exit points, and floor plan layouts. Excuses for not completing a 360 degree size up. I've heard some creative explanations for why responders would not complete a 360 degree size up. Included on the list are some obvious or expected responses and some less than obvious and maybe surprising responses. Let's go through some of the explanations that have been provided to me by firefighters. One, the building was too large and it would have taken too much time for me to walk around it. Two, there was no access to the back side of the structure. Three, we did a three-sided size up by having the driver pull past the structure. Four, I got yelled at by the incident commander for trying to do a 360 degree size up. Five, the next in crew took our hose line and went in while we were doing our 360 degree size up. Six, I knew I was supposed to do it, but I got distracted by the homeowner talking to me. Seven, the fire was coming out the front window. I didn't need to go around the back to see something that was so obvious. Eight, the backyard was fenced in, and there was a big dog in the yard. Nine, there was a victim inside. We didn't have any time to waste on a 360 degree size up. Ten, the second in company will do the 360. The front view and the back view can be very different. I'm not here to judge any of these explanations. Whatever reason offered, it's important to know that failing to do a complete 360 degree size up is a barrier to the formation of situational awareness. As I read casualty investigation reports where firefighters die in residential dwelling fires, the failure to complete a 360 degree size up is very often cited as a contributing factor. So here's some advice I have for you regarding 360 degree size ups. Develop and implement a standard that requires the completion of a 360 degree size up. If your department has this standard, ensure that it's being practiced. If you find out 360 degree size ups are not being done, start asking why. Expect to hear many of the explanations that have been offered by me. I acknowledge there are many conditions that may make completing a 360 degree size up difficult, if not impossible. For example, on June 2, 2011, two firefighters were killed in a residential dwelling fire where a 360 degree size up was not completed. The house was built on the side of a steep hill, making it very difficult to complete the 360. An inadequate size up was a contributing factor. Completing a 360 degree size up is not going to start occurring automatically simply because you have a standard that's developed or an administrator who puts out a directive. The size up must be built into the routines of responders and this gets done through practice and repetition. This includes building the size up into training evolutions. Responders need to be taught what to look for and to listen for, the clues and the cues that are present, and the clues and the cues that are absent. If your department does not do 360 degree size ups now, it may be ingrained in your organization's culture. Like the examples noted above, if someone fears getting yelled at for doing a 360 size up, they may not complete it. If someone thinks that another company is going to take their hose line inside while completing a 360 degree size up, they may not complete it either. Here are some ideas about how to improve on completing 360 degree size ups in your department. Discuss your department's cultural norms about completing a 360 degree size up. If it would be discouraged, or there's a possibility another company would take your hose line, discuss strategies for how the organization 
can overcome these factors. Discuss a time when a 360-degree size-up was not completed and it caused situational awareness to be flawed. This incident discussed does not have to be one where there was a consequence. Discuss a time when a 360-degree size-up was completed and how it improved situational awareness. Now let's discuss a situational awareness near-miss lesson learned. This lesson comes to us from the Firefighter Near-Miss Reporting System, where lessons learn become lessons applied. Crew gets mixed up at structure fire. Here is the account of the reporter. I was on the first arriving engine company at a structure fire in a two-story abandoned house. Heavy flame and thick smoke were coming from the delta side of the structure. Other companies arrived before my crew deployed into the structure. I took one back-end firefighter with six years experience and also a rookie with two weeks of experience. The six-year firefighter and I deployed to the interior delta side, first floor, for attack, but only after assigning the two-week firefighter to the exterior door to pull hose for us. After making an initial attack, we backed out of the delta side to the exterior. I recovered the two-week firefighter, and we went to the truck to exchange air bottles. We entered the Alpha side interior where I once again left the two-week firefighter at the exterior door to pull hose and advance the hose line into the building with the six-year firefighter. We were only six to eight feet inside the structure Alpha side when I decided to back out just enough to direct the two-week firefighter on the hose line behind me. We re-entered re the interior to resume the attack. Shortly after re-entry, command called for a personnel accountability report. I tapped the six-year firefighter on the shoulder as he operated the nozzle. I then turned and tapped who I thought was my two-week firefighter on the helmet. Then I radioed the commander and reported that I had PAR. Command asked me to verify PAR and I confirmed the PAR report. When retreating to the exterior... With empty air, I found the firefighter I thought to be my two-week firefighter. Only it was not my two-week firefighter. It was a 22-year veteran who had been freelancing. Another crew directed my two-week firefighter to advance with them inside the second-story interior. When I questioned the two-week firefighter as to why he followed them, he told me he thought the other crew was me and the six-year firefighter because we all look the same in our turnout gear. He could not tell one crew from the other because the turnout gear all look the same. Here are the lessons learned shared by the reporter. Just because you give an assignment, it doesn't mean the assignment will be carried out. Freelancing is dangerous. Officers should be distinguishable from non-officers on a fire scene. You can read this near miss report and many others by visiting the firefighter near miss.com website. If you've experienced or witnessed a near miss and would like to be interviewed on this show, visit my companion site close call survivor.com and click on the contact us link. Thank you in advance for sharing your lessons learned so that others may live. If you're interested in attending a live event, you can check out the Situational Awareness Matters tour stop schedule at samatters.com. Click on the Program and Keynotes tab just below the header. Then click on the Events Schedule tab. If I'm in your area, I hope you'll consider attending a live event. If you're not able to attend a live event, consider signing up for the SA Matters Online Academy. The Academy contains videos and articles that cover the same content as a three-day live tour event, delivered in 14 modules that you can watch at your own pace from your own computer. 
The Academy Plus version includes four books that are referenced throughout the Academy. The Plus version is a great bargain because the tuition simply covers the cost of the books, making the Academy free. Click on the link below the header on the Essay Matters homepage titled Online Academy. And now let's take a question from an Essay Matters community member. This question comes from a mental management of emergencies class that was held in New York State. What can we do to develop the experience level of young officers who may not see as many fires as we saw in the earlier days of our careers? The best way to develop experience is through responses to fire incidents. However, as the participant noted, the number of fires that they're responding to is declining and so are the opportunities for young officers to get experience. The next best thing to real experience is realistic simulations that are created to mimic real fire conditions and create the same challenges that would be encountered at a real fire. After that, the next best training aids are near-miss reports and line-of-duty death reports where factual data can guide learning about conditions and circumstances that lead to casualties and fatalities. Finally, young officers can benefit from the stories shared by their senior and retired members. The more realistic and elaborative the stories without embellishment of the truth, the more a young officer can learn. The brain cannot distinguish fact from vividly imagined fiction. So the more realistic your training scenarios are, your simulations are, and your shared experiences are, the more likely those experiences are to be stored in the brain of a young officer as if they were real. Well, that's it. Episode 4 is complete. Thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I sincerely appreciate your support of my mission. If you like the show, please go to iTunes and search for SA Matters Radio and subscribe to the podcast and leave your feedback in a five-star review. This will help others find the show. You can also sign up for a free SA Matters monthly newsletter by visiting samatters.com and clicking on the red box on the right side of the homepage. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.